Good morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange and our partners, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on pinion juniper understory response and management implications in a changing climate. We have two speakers that will each present for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have 20 minutes for questions and discussion. The first talk is Fire Impacts in Pinion Juniper Woodlands, Recovery, Plant Invasions, and Restoration Opportunities, presented by Alexandra Urza with the U United States Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station. The second talk is Anticipating Future Climate-Driven Changes in Pinion Juniper Woodlands, presented by Robert Shriver with the University of Nevada, Reno. Before I introduce our presenters, I'll go over some webinar details. We're using Zoom webinar as our platform, and its only drawback is that attendees can't see other attendees. So if you would like, please enter your name and affiliation in the chat so we have a better sense of community on the webinar. But before you do that, please go to your two drop down arrow in your chat box to change the audience of your message from panelist to panelists and everyone. We will also be using the chat for questions, so please type in your questions at any time, and I will field them to the speakers after the presentations. Now I'd like to welcome our presenters. Alexandra Urza is a research ecologist with the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station in Reno, Nevada. She uses observational, experimental, and modeling approaches to study plant community responses to fire, invasive species, climate change, and management treatments. Her current research focuses on the ecology of woodlands and shrublands of the Western United States, seeking to support natural resource management by improving the understanding of the ecological drivers of vegetation change and restoration success. Robert Shriver is an assistant professor of plant ecology and population biology at the University of Nevada, Reno. He studies the mechanisms that drive plant population and ecosystem dynamics from plots to landscapes, then uses this understanding to anticipate and predict the impacts of environmental change in basic and applied settings. He is currently conducting research on how climate, density dependence, disturbance, and management drive the distribution and abundance of shrubland and woodland plant species in the Great Basin and across the Western US. Welcome Ali and Bob, and thanks so much for presenting today. With that, I'll stop sharing my screen and Ali, you can go ahead and share. All right, can you see that slide? Yep, looks great. Great, okay. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, as Janie said, I'm Ali Urza. Um, I'm a research ecologist for Rocky Mountain Research Station. Um, so to, in this talk, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit from yesterday's discussion for those of you who are here. Um, those were focused kind of on the direct effects of drought on tree mortality and tree health. Um, and instead I'm gonna focus on fire impacts in pinion juniper woodlands. Um, so before I start, I wanna um, make sure I acknowledge the many people that have contributed to the work that I'm sharing. Um, I'm going to share some work that was led by former grad student Georgia Basie, um, former postdoc Devin McMahon, um, and Rihanna Jones from the Washoe Tribes Environmental Protection Department. Um, also, Peter Weisberg and Jean Chambers were involved in um, nearly all of the work that I'm sharing today. So um, concerns about the impact of fire in pinion juniper woodlands have become a lot more acute in the last couple of years. Um, anyone who lives in the Great Basin or the Eastern Sierra um, has seen uh, or knows that we've seen huge areas of pinion juniper that have been lost to fire over the last decade. Um, the occurrence of fire, of course, interacts with some of the uh, drought drivers that Peter and Ian talked about yesterday. Um, but the scale of the recent stand replacing fires uh, really requires a different set of considerations. And um, researchers and land managers right now are really kind of grappling with how to respond, how to manage these areas. Um, of course, fires are a natural disturbance in the Western US, um, including in semi-arid woodlands like pinion juniper. And historically, fires would have created a mosaic of different successional stages. Um, so a landscape might have looked something like this photo, um, where you have a mosaic of patches that are dominated by grasses, shrubs, uh, and trees. Um, 
those vegetation mosaics would have been maintained on the landscape, even with pretty infrequent fires, um, because pinyon juniper woodlands are super slow to recover after disturbance. Um, the slow recovery is kind of a common characteristic of dryland ecosystems. Um, but in these systems in particular, uh, the dominant shrubs and trees, so big sagebrush, pinyon, and juniper, are pretty poorly adapted to fire. Uh, they can't survive fire or re-sprout after fire. They have very short distance seed dispersal and a weak seed bank. Um, and some species, especially pinyon and juniper trees, have microsite requirements that um, sometimes require the establishment of other vegetation before they can even um, come back to a site after fire. So these ecosystems have um, really slow successional processes. And after fire, we have this extended period of grass or shrub dominance, like you can see in that photo um, that's up there. And it can take decades or centuries to recover to something that we'd recognize as a woodland. Um, this slow recovery means that there are lots of opportunities during the recovery period for other drivers to kind of shift the trajectory of a site. Um, so this could be another fire, a big drought event, um, heavy grazing, the arrival of a new invasive species or, or something else. Um, another uh, really important piece of this story is the presence of invasive species. And you almost can't talk about fire in the Great Basin without mentioning cheatgrass or Bromus tectorum. Um, this is because fire has the potential to facilitate the invasion of non-native species like cheatgrass that are really adapted to fire. Um, this uh, map that's up here is the output of a hab habitat suitability model um, that was part of a study led by Devin McMahon. Um, the kind of darker red colors show suitable habitat for cheatgrass. Um, and you can see that, well, first, cheatgrass is already widespread across the Western US um, and extensive areas of suitable habitat. So those darker red colors um, overlap with really large areas of Great Basin pinyon juniper woodlands. Um, and looking into the future, warming temperatures are um, allowing cheatgrass habitat to expand upward in elevation kind of deeper into those woodland ecosystems. And fire can really create the conditions for cheatgrass populations to take hold at a site. Um, that fire-induced cheatgrass invasion can initiate what we call a grass fire cycle. This is probably familiar to most of you that work in the Great Basin. Um, cheatgrass uh, senesces early in the season um, and cures into this kind of continuous surface of fine fuels, so it's super flammable. Um, and then after a fire, cheatgrass quickly colonizes burned areas. So this leads to this feedback cycle where increasing fire leads to increasing cheatgrass cover, um, which leads to increasing fire and so on. Um, we know that the highest risk of site conversion after fire um, is on warmer and drier woodland sites, um, and also sites with uh, dense tree cover before fire. These are often places where there's kind of, there's an absence of the native perennial herbaceous species that can compete effectively with cheatgrass. Um, so this sets up, sets up a situation where a lot of warm and dry uh, woodland ecosystems are quite susceptible to this change. Um, so the fine fuels that are created by cheatgrass, as I said, um, alter fire behavior, and this facilitates fire spread and often uh, leads to larger fires. So this figure that's up here is from a recent report that was led by my colleague, Dave Ford. Um, the bar plot shows the size of the largest fire in each calendar year over the last three decades. Um, and you can see that there's a clear upward trend. This figure only goes, has data through 2014, and that trend has actually increased quite a bit um, in the years since then. Um, and that uh, change is driven at least in part by the um, increased uh, ab abundance of cheatgrass across the landscape. Um, this photo here uh, shows what this looks like kind of in real life on the ground. So cheatgrass invaded areas, those kind of yellow areas in the foreground um, are more likely to ignite um, and they can support fire spread up into woodlands and forests that historically would have burned much more patchily. Um, those burned areas then become invaded um, and then they're more likely to burn again. And the cheatgrass fire cycle kind of pushes progressively up into these woodland areas. Um, that cycle is exactly what we've been seeing in the Pine Nut Mountains in Western Nevada. This is um, a mountain range. Uh, the Southern portion of this mountain range is just Southeast of Carson City. Um, and we've had a cycle where over the last decade, 
Um, we've had repeated fires that, that have caused progressive loss of culturally important woodlands in that area. Um, this map here shows, it looks like a bowl of spaghetti, but it, those are overlapping fire polygons. Um, and the first uh, large fires that occurred in this portion of the mountain range were in 2011 and 2012. Um, and you can see that over in the decade between then and now, uh, we've just had repeated fires kind of increasingly um, expanding the impacted area um, in that ecosystem. Um, like I said, uh, as I mentioned, these areas were historically important for harvesting pine nuts and other traditional practices for multiple tribes in the region. Um, and this is uh, this example is part of a pattern of the loss of a lot of culturally important woodland stands from the Western Great Basin um, from recent fire. So these big fires have had us asking, um, can we restore burned woodlands to prevent this cycle of repeated fires, um, especially in areas that tribes or public land managers want to prioritize for woodland recovery um, or as, a, as an effort to maintain that functioning ecosystem mosaic. So a mosaic of shrublands, woodlands, and other habitat types and not just the cheatgrass monoculture. Um, we do have quite a bit of knowledge related to restoring the understory component of burned woodlands um, based on research from the last couple of decades. Um, we know that native perennial herbaceous species, so perennial grasses and forbs, are the most effective competitors with cheatgrass. So the establishment of grasses, forbs, and also shrubs is really critical for avoiding that conversion to cheatgrass dominance after fire. Um, this figure here shows the result of uh, one study that we did in central Nevada where pinyon juniper woodlands were either uh, left unburned, uh, burned without any post-fire seeding or burned and then seeded with a mix of native species. Um, the y-axis is the percent uh, vegetation cover and um, each of those columns represents each of those treatment types. Um, and then the boxes are different types of vegetation. So the grays are shrubs, the greens are those perennial grasses and forbs, and then the red polka dots are, is cheatgrass cover. Um, and you can see that, uh, so this figure is from 13 years after fire where kind of some of those post-fire site dynamics were allowed to play out. Um, and the burn sites that were seeded had both higher native vegetation cover um, and much lower cheatgrass cover than the unseeded sites. Um, so from that study and other related research, we can kind of summarize some main factors that influence post-fire seeding success. Um, so first, the most important factor is um, the environmental conditions of a site and then the weather that um, you happen to experience after seeding. Uh, hot and dry areas are less likely to have a seeding succeed right away. Um, cooler and wetter high elevation areas um, will probably recover on their own. So a lot of times management requires kind of uh, prioritizing the trade-off between sites that need restoration and sites that are likely to uh, successfully be restored. Um, and in some of those uh, hotter and drier sites in particular, there's a good chance that you'll hit a bad weather year after a seeding. And so um, we, I think we need more recognition of um, that sometimes we need to uh, repeat seeding treatments in higher priority areas if we really want them to succeed. Um, second, uh, grazing can constrain the recovery of perennial species, especially those uh, perennial grasses that are the best competitors against cheatgrass. Um, so a period of deferment, um, of grazing deferment after seeding can allow plants to pass that critical establishment phase and more effectively uh, compete with cheatgrass or inhibit cheatgrass invasion. And then finally, um, seeding native species with a high functional diversity and at high rates um, is a type of bet hedging strategy. Uh, we, our ecosystems are incredibly heterogeneous, um, both through space at small scales and through time. Um, and seeding functionally diverse seed mixes is a way of kind of ensuring that the right species um, is at the site um, and is able to, um, to successfully establish in, in a particular site uh, condition. Okay, so um, more recently, in, I, I'd say in fairly recent years, um, we've been wondering whether we can speed succession or speed the recovery of woodland ecosystems by planting dryland tree species in places that are prioritized for um, restoring those woodland ecosystems. Uh, and given the rate and the scale of recent woodland loss, 
um, this approach is becoming, it's becoming more and more apparent that we need to start thinking about ways that we can restore the tree component to these uh, ecosystems. Um, so our research group is working on a few different projects to try to understand the potential for planting pinion pine for restoration of burned woodlands. Um, for the last few years, we've been working on a project uh, with the Washoe tribe, um, as, and they've been testing out some pretty innovative restoration methods in culturally important woodlands um, in the pine nut range, that example that I showed before with, um, that's experienced a cycle of repeated fires. Uh, this project is led by Rihanna Jones, who's the interim director of their environmental protection department. Um, and the approach that they're taking is um, to uh, restore in uh, high investment restoration islands. Um, so in places with favorable topography that have a high chance of succeeding, they are seeding understory species. They're also planting sagebrush seedlings um, and they've been planting pinion pine seedlings um, under shrubs in these sites. Um, the, at least in our region in the Reno, uh, region, there may also be progress is happening elsewhere, but I know that um, the BLM and the Humboldt Toyabe National Forest are, are both looking into options for uh, planting pinion pine trees into some of the recent fires um, that have happened just over the last couple of years. So our research group is trying to help support these efforts, um, trying to leverage what we know about the ecology of these species to help um, inform these restoration approaches. So uh, one example of using ecological knowledge to guide restoration is the use of microsites in restoration planting. Um, in the wild, uh, out kind of in natural conditions, pinion and juniper seedlings that aren't growing right under a tree canopy are almost always found under sagebrush shrubs, or sometimes shrubs of other species, but mostly sagebrush. Um, in this photo, oops, this photo here, um, uh, inside this red circle, uh, there's a little pinion pine seedling that you can see is growing up right next to the stem of, of that sagebrush shrub. Um, and this is something that we commonly see. So we've done a bunch of experiments to uh, test the importance of that habitat, um, sagebrush microhabitat on single leaf pinion pine establishment, the establishment of uh, Pinus pinophila, which is the pinion pine species in the Great Basin. Um, we have planted seeds and seedlings into different environments across um, an elevational gradient uh, ranging from the kind of lowest uh, extent of woodlands to the high upper tree line edge. Um, and to kind of uh, cut to the chase, we found that we haven't had a single seedling at any elevation and in any place survive the first year without um, some sort of sagebrush, without sagebrush cover. Um, so this figure here shows uh, the y-axis is the percentage of seedlings that survived their first year. Um, the kind of three groups of plots are from the lower tree line, um, middle of the woodland belt, and then the, the high elevation upper tree line site. Um, and the uh, different colors are the different microhabitats. And so in inner spaces, so the places between shrubs, as well as in places where we, we removed a shrub and then planted right into that environment, um, we had zero survival of uh, first year seedlings at any elevation. Um, and the undershrub uh, seedlings survived at uh, surprisingly high rates, um, especially compared to some of the rates of uh, tree planting success in restoration projects in our, in our region. Um, so this really just underscores the importance of those microsite conditions for alleviating climate stress in the really harsh environments that we live in. Um, in a restoration context, uh, we know that pinion pine plantings then need to target shaded microsites. Um, so we've been planting seed seedlings under sagebrush in a lot of different environments since that experiment that I showed you before. Um, and we've had really, really high sur survival in some places, um, over 80% survival in the first year. Um, working with the Washoe, uh, they have been planting under other shrub species where there isn't sagebrush available. And so we're um, hoping to track the survival of those seedlings and see differences in um, responses to different nurse species. Um, and then they're also using nurse logs and other shade objects like this photo on the right um, to create some uh, shade conditions in places where shrubs aren't available. Okay, so um, another question that we've been asking is the role of uh, intraspecific variation on restoration success. 
Um, for a lot of other species, we know a ton about seed selection for restoration, um, and we're really just starting to get starting to gather that information for pinion pine. Um, Georgia Vasey was a graduate student that worked with myself and Peter Weisberg, um, and she did uh, a common garden study of Pinus monophila, where she collected seeds from 23 provenances across the range of, of, of Pinus monophila, pinion, single leaf pinion pine. Um, each of these different shapes is a different seed collection site. Um, and we targeted, um, we collected seeds across a range of elevations in nine different mountain ranges that were uh, targeted to span a gradient of overall dryness and then also seasonality of precipitation. Um, so uh, first, uh, as part of Georgia's thesis work, um, she looked at differences in the traits of mature trees across the, the range, um, across the range of the species. Uh, this figure here shows the relationship between site aridity, so how dry the site was on the, on the x-axis, and seed traits on the y-axis. Um, and she found that uh, trees from drier sites generally produced larger seeds, but fewer of them than uh, trees from wetter sites. Um, but there was also a lot of variation among trees from the same site. So you can see kind of the, the range of spread along the y-axis at, at each of those environments. Um, Georgia then used the seed collections to grow out seedlings in the greenhouse um, and see how different populations uh, respond to a gradient of water availability. And we've also done, um, we are in the progress of um, replicating this experiment or slight uh, modification of this experiment in a, a field setting. Um, so we found that the differences among pinion pine populations persist as seedling trait and performance differences. Um, this figure here shows climatic water deficit of the seed collection site on the x-axis. So this was how, how dry um, the seed collection site was, and then stem diameter on the y-axis. And then each of those different colors of lines shows uh, a different watering treatment from very, uh, very dry treatments in the greenhouse to very wet treatments. Um, and in multiple experiments, we found that seedlings from more arid climates grow larger, both above ground and below ground, and have higher survival in pretty much every condition we can throw at them, very wet conditions, very dry conditions. Um, and we see this effect of, seed, of the source climate even after we control for seed size, which we know is um, an important uh, predictor of seedling performance. Okay, so to kind of stay on time, um, I'm gonna wrap up with a few takeaways here. Um, First, uh, the interaction of increasingly large fires and plant invasions are resulting in the loss of important woodlands in the Western US. Um, and we need to start thinking about prioritizing woodland protection, protection of residual stands um, in burned areas and restoration of burned stands for wildlife and cultural values. Um, second, uh, we uh, have the tools to promote understory recovery um, and that's needed to maintain uh, site resilience and to inhibit cheatgrass invasion or the invasion of other non-native species. Um, we can evaluate site conditions to determine the need for restoration and the potential for recovery. Um, and we can uh, seed with functionally diverse seed mixes and uh, plant shrubs in high priority areas, um, knowing that we might need repeated entries or repeated seeding treatments in some places. Um, and then finally, we're um, starting to have a better understanding of how we can uh, use tree plantings to speed recovery to woodland conditions. Um, there, it's important, as I've emphasized, to use our ecological knowledge to increase the planting success, so like the use of those microsites. Um, and we also just have a lot of information that we still uh, need to gather. So we need to have a better understanding of planting approaches, uh, seedling traits, and propagation methods. And so. Um, we're hoping to um, continue partnering, partnering with practitioners um, to learn as we go uh, through adaptive management. So that's all that I have. Um, thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer questions after Bob's talk. Thank you so much, Allie. All right, if you have questions for Allie, please put them in the chat and then Bob will get started and we'll take all the questions at the end. Great, um, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, I'm Bob Shriver and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. Today I'm gonna to be talking about some work 
Um, that's a collaboration between me and John Bradford at the USGS Southwest Biological Science Center, Charles Jakulik, who's a statistician at the Southwest Biological Science Center, and um, Dave Bell, who's with the Pacific Northwest Research Station um, in Corvallis, Oregon with the Forest Service. And this work was um, funded by the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center and then also the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, and for those of you that were at Peter Weisberg's talk yesterday, some of this is going to be a little bit of a repeat, but I just wanted to put um, the dynamics, the range dynamics of pinion and juniper in sort of a historical context. And so throughout much of the 19th and 20th century, the kind of dominant paradigm that people have thought about pinion and juniper woodlands has been one of sort of expansion, that the rangelands or the, the woodlands are expanding into lower elevations and expanding into air, um, new areas. And the, the causes of that are sort of multifaceted. Um, it could be expansion into areas where previous timber harvesting occurred, expansion into new areas driven by um, uh, grazing practices, alterations in fire regime, fire suppression. But that's kind of been the, the, the sort of perspective that people have taken on pinyon juniper woodlands, particularly from a management perspective. And this image just shows expansion of Western juniper in an area of Oregon. And so you can see there's supposed a lot of sort of range expansion, but then also infilling in higher densities than there were um, previously. More recently, there's been a lot of concern about the long-term viability of pinyon juniper woodlands though, because of some really notable mortality events. And so um, probably the earliest and um, most widely cited is a big die off of Pinus edgeless, Colorado or two needle pinyon pine. Um, in the early 2000s. And so this map on the left kind of shows those areas. Uh, the red is areas where those mortality events occurred and the green is just the larger range of two needle pinion. Um, more recently, there's been some mortality events in juniper species. So there's a mortality event in Southern Utah in 2018. And then even this year, there's been some pretty widespread um, noted mortality or at least canopy dieback in um, juniper in northern Arizona and southern Utah. And so this is happening in both species, even juniper, which is thought to have been more drought tolerant. Um, and so those are both examples from the Colorado Plateau, but that's also happening here in the Great Basin. And so Peter yesterday mentioned some of his work, um, an example from um, central Nevada. Um, and it, this is something I've even noted um, sort of going out and setting up some of my own field sites here in western Nevada, kind of along the Nevada-California border that there's a lot of locations where die-off is occurring, at least patchily, um, but at fairly large scales. And in many cases, even where die-off isn't occurring, um, it seems like sort of uh, stand health has declined in many areas and the trees just are looking like they're, you know, sort of being attacked by um, various pests as well, even if they haven't um, had full-scale mortality. Um, but as a population biologist, I would sort of argue that canopy die-off or dieback of individuals can only sort of tell us part of what we need to know to understand what's going to happen with pinyon juniper going forward. And so where species can occur ultimately is controlled by both the mortality rate and the recruitment rate. So how many new individuals are coming into the population? And so in many cases, we might have a climate gradient where mortality increases as temperatures get warmer, for example. Um, and the population may be able to absorb some of that increase in mortality because it has relatively high recruitment already. Um, and then ultimately we might reach a threshold where this population growth rate equals one, where mortality and recruitment are basically completely lined up and the population is totally stable. And then ultimately we might reach a threshold where it passes that and populations begin to decline. And so it's really important that we know something about that recruitment rate to be able to understand what's happening with this um, population currently and what might happen into the future. And so ultimately, if we reach that tipping point, we might reach the point where population density or cover or some other metric of the, the population health reaches a tipping point where populations begin to decline where they might've been healthy or stable before. And so that's been a big focus of a lot of our work is trying to understand what's going on with these recruitment rates alongside mortality and try to anticipate where populations are declining and what's driving that. And so the goals of this project have been to identify the environmental conditions leading to this increased vulnerability, um, anticipate regions within each species range where declines are most likely to occur, and identify the role of both mortality and recruitment in driving this population vulnerability. Uh, and so to do that, we use the forest inventory and analysis data. Um, and I'm not gonna really dig too much into the details of how that data is collected, but there is an important thing to know, which is that for larger trees, those trees are tagged and marked and they're remeasured every 10 years. Um, and so that gives us good information on survival 
and growth of those larger trees, but it sort of lacks information on those smaller trees that were, are really important for recruitment. And so for individuals that are less than uh, a, an inch in diameter, 2.54 centimeters, um, those individuals are not marked, but they're counted over time. So we know how many there are at a given time, but we don't necessarily know the processes that drove that change in numbers, whether that was survival or new recruitment. And so I'll get back to that in just a second. Um, I'm not gonna dig too far into the, the modeling work, but I just wanna sort of highlight some important components. And so we built models for individual demographic rates. So for the survival rate slash mortality rate of individuals, and then also the growth rate. And the basic structure that takes on is we're trying to predict the survival of an individual in plot D, for example. And that's explained by covariates, which include the size of that plant, growing season soil moisture, growing season temperature, and then the extant density or basal area in that plot of trees. And then the response of that demographic rate is then controlled by some um, parameter that describes the sensitivity of that vital rate to those covariates. And so that includes those sort of environmental conditions that we think might be important for driving survival or for driving growth or for driving recruitment. And then in addition to that, we know that average climate conditions don't tell us everything we need to know about what drives demographic rates. Um, other aspects of climate that we're not accounted for can be really important, slope, aspect, soils, biotic conditions, all of these things that are really hard to capture in any given model. And that's all soaked up by this spatial random effect. And so what that is, is it basically is accounting for the difference between what we actually observe in the plot and what the climate covariates can explain. And it does it in a spatially correlated way because we know that plots that are near each other are more similar because they have similar soil or there's dispersal or there's similar biotic conditions. And so it helps us account for that process. Um, and so thinking about what this looks like in practice, we can explain sort of spatial variability in demographic rates and population performance based off of the covariates that we included, which vary spatially, but then also these spatial random effects, which kind of absorb um, all of the uncertainty. Um, that we can't explain with just the covariates alone. I just want to touch briefly on the recruitment model because people often have a lot of questions about this. And we just recently published a paper in ecology that um, you're, um, I'm happy to share with anyone that's interested, but it covers the details. But the basic challenge with estimating recruitment from this FIA data is the individual counted. So we don't know when there's new individuals, for example, this change from 10 to 13 individuals, whether that's just three new recruits or whether that for example, three individuals died and then six new recruits sort of came in. And so the goal is to try to account for both that survival, growth, and recruitment process together simultaneously with an integrated population model. And then we can estimate what the true underlying rate of recruitment is. And that's basically what we did. And we're able to do that with relatively high accuracy, or at least recover the observed numbers of individuals in plots, which gives us a fairly um, high level of confidence that this is sort of is providing us some useful information about what recruitment actually is in these plots. Uh, so just moving on from there. Uh, hear that. Um, so just looking at the um, climate responses of a particular species, we can sort of estimate how demographic rates respond to different climate variables. And so here I have growing season soil water availability, temperature, and then also the stand basal area. And we're looking at both the recruitment rate and the survival probability. And this is for Pinus edulis, um, two needle pinion, kind of found throughout the Colorado Plateau. Um, and so what we see is in general, as soil water availability increases, the recruitment rate increases, survival increases. But there's a lot of variability around this. And so each one of these little points represents an individual plot. And so the variability around that is because environmental conditions are variable within plots, and that's what's being absorbed by the spatial random effects. And so it sort of accounts for these large scale patterns that we see where recruitment can increase as conditions get um, wetter, but there's also lots of variability around that. Similarly with temperature, we see a slight response of recruitment to temperature, but there's a pretty notable response of tree survival to temperature. Um, and then looking at survival probability and um, recruitment in response to basal area for this species, we see um, fairly clear signals of some density dependence where um, survival and recruitment decline as a function of increasing basal area. But this is sort of idiosyncratic across species, as I'll show in just a little bit, and, and across plots as well, likely. And so we can use this information to then understand where certain areas with high recruitment and high survival are occurring and where they co-occur. 
And so this is just an example, again, with Pinus edulis sort of plotting out these recruitment rates across the species range. We can see there's areas of relatively low recruitment in northeastern Arizona, kind of the Four Corners region. And similarly, looking at survival probability, um, and we can see that there's some areas that occurred over this time period, which is basically from about 2005 to 2015, which is when these samples occurred somewhere in those that time range, um, where there was relatively high mortality in northern Arizona and some in kind of western Colorado. And so now that we have these estimated demographic rates, we can combine them in structured population models and actually estimate sort of where we are along this trajectory of recruitment and mortality and begin to identify locations and climate conditions under which population vulnerability increases for all five of these species. Um, and so I'm gonna be showing a series of plots that look pretty similar to this. And I just wanted to explain what they were beforehand. And so on the y-axis, we have the proportion of all of the plots in that climate condition that have growing populations. So the total proportion of populations that have this population growth rate above one. In each one of these box plots basically represents 10% of the plot. So it's a 10% quantile covering that environmental condition. Out here on the edges, those boxes are wider because we have fewer plots. In the middle, those boxes are narrower. So in this example, um, looking at this blue box, we have about um, 90, somewhere maybe 85% of the plots on average are declining, um, have population growth rates less than one. And then I'm showing this with two different assumptions. So one is the current basal area and one is a low basal area. And so you can see the difference at which basal area contributes to this population vulnerability. And then finally, the sort of variability around each one of these box plots sort of is a representation of our uncertainty. And this uncertainty basically comes from the uncertainty that's quantified within our modeling approach to tell us um, what is the, um, the uncertainty that we have in our estimates of these different demographic rates. And so, for example, in this case, the, the proportion of populations could be as high as maybe 95% that are growing or as low as 70% that are growing. And that's sort of quantified in these box plots. And so I'm gonna show a series of these for all of the different species we're studying, Pinus edulis, Pinus monophila, Juniperus osteosperma, Juniperus monosperma, and scopularum. So um, two needle pinion, sing, single leaf pinion, Utah juniper, uh, one seed juniper, and Colorado, or Rocky Mountain juniper. Um, and this is across soil water availability conditions um, across its range. And so what we see is a pretty clear trend with all of the species that as soil water conditions um, become drier, population vulnerability increases. So the proportion of populations that are growing are stable declines. Um, the degree to which this is happening varies pretty considerably across species. So Pinus edulis seems to have the highest population vulnerability, which kind of matches up with what we would expect, given what we know just about general observations of these species. But it's also happening in Pinus monophila um, and some of the juniper species. Utah juniper in particular seems to be really resilient. There's not much of an indication of population declines going on with this species in particular. Um, but what little evidence we do have, it does seem like the population vulnerability does increase as conditions dry. Similarly, looking across temperature conditions, so growing season temperature, we can see that population vulnerability tends to increase as temperatures get warmer. There's um, a lot more uncertainty in some of these and a little bit more um, idiosyncrasy. Um, but again, the general trend is that population vulnerability does tend to increase as conditions get warmer. And I also just want to point out too that higher density often does have a negative effect on the population performance of these species. So having these really dense stands does often lead to declines because of perhaps interactions with drought and density. Um, but this is really idiosyncratic among species. And so in different species, the effect is stronger. And there's also likely variability among sites and interactions between climate conditions and density that we're not actually capturing here, but are sort of coming through in the uncertainty. And that's why we have um, so much uncertainty and what the sort of effect of density is. So we can use these same models then to try to identify vulnerable regions and identify areas where population decline is occurring or maybe about to occur. And so these are maps of all of those FIA plots for all of the different species I just mentioned, showing what the popu estimated population growth rate is. And so what we can see is there's some really high um, vulnerability areas, for example, for Pinus edulis here in the center part of its range, 
But if we move over to single leaf pinion, it's more spread out. And in general, single leaf pinion seems to be doing better, which kind of matches up with sort of casual observations in a lot of the scientific literature out there. But there are areas of higher vulnerability, for example, in the northwestern part of the range, which kind of matches up with what Peter mentioned yesterday. Um, Southern Sierras, and then some of these areas in the eastern part of its range, um, it does seem like vulnerability uh, might be a little bit higher. And there's this risk of population decline that's already occurring or might be about to occur. For some of the other species, um, the variability in vulnerability, um, really, it really varies across where the species are. Um, uh, one seed juniper seems to be particularly vulnerable right now along the Mogollon Rim in Arizona. And then um, Rocky Mountain juniper seems to have a sort of classic latitudinal trend where populations really far north are doing quite well, whereas further south, the vul population vulnerability seems to be increasing. And as I said earlier, we were really interested in trying to understand what's the sort of relative contribution of the mortality versus recruitment to these population trends. And so this sort of helps us understand, like, can we learn everything we need to know about the future of these species by just focusing on mortality or how important is recruitment? And so this series of plots is basically showing for each species, the population level recruitment rate along the Y axis and the population level mortality rate on the X axis. These gray bars are the median rates for each one of those demographic rates for all across all of those FIA plots. And so you can sort of think of this as the typical condition or like above and below median conditions, above or below normal. This orange line is the cutoff line where if it's to the left of that line in these blue points, that population is growing. And if it's to the right, that population is declining. And so what we can see is that, for example, in Pinus edulis, most of the plots that are declining actually have below median recruitment and above median mortality. And there's very few that have above median recruitment and below median mortality and are still declining. And there's very few that have above or below median mortality and above median recruitment or below median recruitment and are declining. So in most cases, what we need is both low recruitment and high mortality to lead to population declines. And there's a number of cases in which we have elevated recruitment or elevated mortality, but recruitment is actually high enough to compensate and vice versa. There's some conditions in which mortality might be somewhat low compared to typical conditions, but we're seeing um, the populations are declining just because of um, low recruitment. And so this trend tends to hold up across all of the species as well. And so, for example, in Pinus monophila, um, the populations that we do estimate are declining, um, at least the, on average are declining, are both ones that have low, below median recruitment and above median mortality. So high mortality, low recruitment. And this holds up across all of the different species. Juniperus osteosperma, we didn't actually estimate on average any of those populations are declining, and so there's none in that region, but it holds up looking across all of these species. And so it does appear that increased mortality alone is often insufficient to explain population vulnerability and decline. And we need to know something about recruitment to really know what's going on with a lot of these populations. And so just a few takeaways to um, kind of wrap things up before we move on to our discussion. First is that population vulnerability seems to be greatest in warm and dry conditions. And this kind of tends to carry across all of these pinyon juniper species, but it, the degree to which it impacts uh, any given species is really highly variable. Warming and drying conditions moving forward into the future are very likely to increase vulnerability. And where this happens might depend on interactions between density dependence and climate conditions. Um, but it's a fairly safe bet that in many locations, as conditions warm and dry, the populations are going to become vulnerable. Um, Die-off alone probably can't tell us everything we need to know about population vulnerability. And getting a better understanding of what drives recruitment and what drives population recovery is going to be really essential for understanding where populations are most vulnerable going forward. And then there's also potential opportunities for silvicultural techniques to increase population resistance and resilience to warming and drying conditions. And Peter talked about this pretty ex extensively, and so did Ian yesterday, opportunities to sort of improve civil cultural techniques to improve the long-term outlook for many of these populations. And I also just wanted to point out too that population expansion and population decline are not mutually exclusive processes, and density dependence can really play an important role in this. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of briefly touch on some work that uh, my postdoc Emily Schultz is starting, looking at the sort of role of density dependence and climate in driving um, the dynamics of um, 
pinion, single leaf pinion, um, kind of along the California Nevada borders, focusing on a more discrete small area. And what we're seeing is that often, even over relatively small spatial scales, you have both decline and expansion happening. And a lot of this seems to be, attribute, uh, be attributable to current densities and so density dependence. So areas that are really high density experience warmer and drier conditions and population decline begins to occur. But in more marginal areas along the edge or where population expansion may be occurring, the density is low enough that they're not as affected by those warm, dry conditions. And so expansion is happening at the same time decline is occurring. And this is often happening over relatively small spatial areas. So like less than a kilometer, you can have expansion happening at the same time decline is occurring. And so density dependence can be really important for sort of understanding what's driving this. And that could be competition among trees, um, increases in pests and pathogens that can be driven by high densities and all of those sort of dynamics that are really important to understand, but also are probably really critical to, to under anticipating where decline is going to occur and where expansion is going to occur on local scales. Um, and so um, with that, I'll just say thank you and I will uh, step aside so we can begin the question and answer session. Great, thanks, Bob. That was really interesting. Um, Okay, if you have questions for Ali or Bob, please type them into the chat and I'll just start at the top here. Um, Ali, you had talked about nurse plants and logs <laughs> and um, someone asked, is it just shade? Oh, I, I guess it's specific to sagebrush. Is it just shade or is the sage catching snow and pulling up moisture um, from deeper in the soil profile to help, um, to help seedling, tree seedlings grow? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, with the one experiment um, that I showed the figure, figure on seedling survival for, um, we did also measure a lot of environmental characteristics under the shrubs and in the inner spaces to try to get at that. Um, my, uh, uh, based on what we did uh, collect, my intuition is that it is primarily a shading effect. Um, so sagebrush, obviously, um, the shade impact can kind of reduce evapor evaporative demand on the surface soil. So in theory, it could um, increase the soil moisture in some of the surface soils. Um, and sagebrush can also uh, redistribute water through its roots um, through a process called uh, hydraulic redistribution, where it can actually kind of pull up uh, deeper uh, soil moisture and kind of redistribute it in the shallower soil. Um, but we actually found that there weren't meaningful differences in soil moisture in kind of those um, in, in those inner space environments and the under shrub environments. And that's because sagebrush is also using the water. So it's really kind of this balance, the facilitative effect of, is this balance between the sagebrush providing a shaded environment, um, which is more favorable and has kind of less temperature stress um, that reduces evaporation, um, but sagebrush is also competing for some of that water. So in short, we think it is largely um, that it's an effective uh, shade structure. Um, but part of that question, um, is still a little bit unaddressed. We don't really know why sagebrush in particular is really favored as a nurse plant in, um, in natural conditions. And so um, we are hoping to get a better understanding of kind of the differences in the shade structures that are provided by different shrub species to, to try to get us out of it. Great, thanks. Uh, there's a few grazing questions. How long of a grazing deferment do you recommend for more successful understory seeding post-fire? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I'm probably going to give a fairly unsatisfying answer, which is that it really depends on the site that you're on. Um, so uh, productivity and kind of the rate that uh, that plants establishing from seeds will develop into reproductively mature plants is going to be really different from site to site. Um, and this is one of the reasons why um, post-fire grazing deferment prescriptions are supposed to be you know, variable among sites. I think what often happens is that kind of, there's a standard two year uh, post fire deferment period that tends to be applied pretty um, regularly across environments. Um, and I think that there are a lot of reasons to think that some sites will need a longer period of time to have, to really have um, both naturally establishing plants and uh, seeded plants be able to establish um, sufficiently to be uh, uh, resilient to that grazing effect. So that's somewhat unsatisfying, but um, you know, it is, this is one of the reasons why we have um, really knowledgeable range managers that work on our public lands that you know, know sites, um, understand uh, plant production potential and um, can help make some of those decisions at a site level. 
Great. And, um, you know, for a variety of reasons, it's hard to tease apart, you know, grazing studies um, from other things. So, so there's a question about, are you aware or involved in any research that controls for grazing post fire so that grazing impacts can be isolated from other variables? Is that happening? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, this isn't really my area of research focus, um, but there are there is a lot of great research that has been done um, through the ARS, um, through the, uh, the rangeland uh, department um, at UNR and, and a lot of other rangeland departments um, that do use grazing exposures um, that are kind of phased out in a period of time to, to try to isolate the effect of grazing. Um, again, grazing is a complicated topic because it really interacts with a lot of these other drivers. Grazing can sometimes um, can, it can be used in a targeted way to, um, to graze seasonally to reduce cheatgrass abundance, for example. Um, graze, grazing can also um, be a kind of vector of seed dispersal for new invasive species. Um, and so it really, you know, year to year and site to site grazing will have really different um, impacts. So um, yeah, but, but it's not really my area of research focus. Okay, great, thanks. Um, great talk, Ali. How do you see drought-driven tree mortality and associated biotic disturbance, such as phyto, let's see, how do I say this word? Phytophagous insects, root rots, and other pathogens interacting with future fire risk and fire regimes in the Great Basin, P in Great Basin PJ? Um, yeah, so I, I could think about that question kind of two ways. One is the, I think the easiest way to think about it is that the drought driven tree mortality and disturbances um, do uh, change the, the abundance and the distribution of fuels on the landscape, um, especially uh, they create um, dead heavy fuels. And especially when we think about kind of changing climate and the increasing frequency of these really high severity prolonged droughts, um, those types of really severe drought conditions um, that can, be long enough to really effectively reduce fuel moisture in those bigger fuel classes um, can increase kind of the role of those heavy fuels on fire behavior, if that makes sense. So certainly um, increased tree mortality um, increases the presence of heavy fuels that are available to burn um, in, the, in extreme weather events and in prolonged drought periods that we're expecting to see more in the future. Um, I ha I'm not aware and I can't think offhand of kind of mechanisms for the relationship to go the other way where burned uh, areas might provide opportunities for, um, I don't know, dispersal of some of the biotic disturbers or, um, or kind of provide situations where, I don't know, one could imagine um, that the abundance of burned fuel on the landscape might provide uh, environments that are favorable for some uh, insect populations to increase that might colonize um, outside of the burned area, but I'm not really, that's much more speculative. Great, thanks. Um, would we be able to measure the benefit from planting juniper in conjunction with pinion in order to provide for that species diversity and resilience from changing climate and insects and disease? Um, I think this is a great idea. Uh, so when I, in my talk, I kind of talked about how uh, the propagation and kind of use for restoration of pinion pine is pretty new. Um, and we're really just trying to, um, starting to get a, an understanding of how we would do that. Um, that process is even farther behind for juniper species. So there are definitely a lot of kind of logistical constraints to doing that right at this moment. Um, but uh, conceptually or hypothetically, there are a lot of reasons to believe that increasing tree diversity would have positive impacts, both on um, vegetation resilience, like um, Bob's talk and Peter's and Ian's talks yesterday, you know, really highlighted the fact that different tree species are responding differently to different types, types of drought um, uh, conditions. And so having greater tree diversity on the landscape um, certainly would increase kind of resilience as in that type of bet hedging way that I talked about a little bit. Um, and then also the increasing tree diversity would um, probably increase the biodiversity of organisms across a whole range of trophic levels. So um, from birds to small mammals and even invertebrates that are also very important components of the woodland ecosystem. So 
I'd love to try that. I think that's from Duncan. Um, we should talk about that, Duncan. So it'd be really fun to, to think about it more. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Okay, for Bob, how might availability of viable seed and its variation across climate and weather conditions influence population vulnerability? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, I think we know from a lot of um, site-based studies and studies that sort of specifically focused on seed viability that climate conditions and weather conditions can be really important for whether or not seeds end up being viable from um, cone production and that could be really important. We can't actually get at that with the data that we have because what we have is basically the end result of that, the number of new plants that are sort of produced on the landscape. And so it's sort of a cumulative estimate based off of all of the different processes that might control that. So that's cone production, seed viability, how many of those seeds actually germinate and turn into small trees. And so all those processes are sort of implicitly included in our estimates of recruitment. And so we can't necessarily tease apart, but we know from other research that that's definitely an important process. Great, thanks. Um, are FIA plots exempt from vegetation treatments? If not, are you tracking trends, particularly in recruitment in these areas as well? Yeah, so they are not. Um, vegetation treatments occur in FIA plots. And I should have mentioned this before, um, but I didn't in the interest of time. So we excluded all plots in which fire or vegetation treatments occurred, at least that were noted vegetation treatments. So any, any thinning, removal of trees, um, silvicultural stuff or fire um, to try to really get the climate effects. Um, so we haven't looked at that part. Um, and I also think it's sort of an aside to that. I think it's worth I forgot to mention this earlier, but it's also worth noting too that we were probably underestimating to some degree the vulnerability of some of these populations on the warm dry end because FIA doesn't actually include many of the warmest driest locations that pinyon pine lives and juniper lives because they don't classify them as forests. They have to have a certain level of canopy cover. I think it's 20% to be classified as forests that are then going to be measured as part of FIA. And so we're likely underestimating, especially on that warm dry end, how vulnerable some of these populations are. Great, thanks. There seems to be a lot of overlap for high basal area and lower basal area in your figures, blue and red box plots, for most species except for Pinus edulis. Does this suggest that thinning will not help with population growth rates? Yeah, so I, I, there was a few species where it seems like there's a relatively clear um, trend that high density tends to decrease population performance. So edulis is one of them. And then there's a couple of juniper species like um, Rocky Mountain juniper and, um, jun and one seed juniper. There seem to be fairly clear trends, but there were some where it's not as clear. And I think a lot of this has to do with many of the things that um, Ali talked about and Peter talked about where there's a sort of inter sort of interactions of a lot of different processes going on. And depending on what the you know, observations of interactions between mortality and density or interaction between climate and density are and whether or not you know having host nurse plants and things like that are really important for recruitment what the end result of density is is really complex and we're not really able just because of the nature of the data to kind of start to tease those apart with the data that we have but i think there are really important questions and there's still a lot of research to be done about what are what effective sort of silvicultural treatments look like great um, back to Ali, by functionally diverse seed mix, do you mean including shrub, grass, and forbs in the mix? Also, have you tried planting sagebrush and protected microsites to see if that improves survival? Uh, um, definitely planting shrubs, grasses, and forbs is um, probably going to cover the a large portion of kind of the range of functional vari variability. But um, I, I also think it's important to think about uh, trait variability within those functional types. So for example, um, in the grass group, um, a lot of times there's a tendency to plant primarily deep-rooted perennial grasses, which um, are more productive. They tend to be kind of better forage species and such, but there's a lot of evidence that the shallower rooted grass species are actually more effective competitors with cheatgrass. Um, so things like uh, Poa secunda and um, Elemis to a certain extent. Um, and so because they're using soil moisture from the same portion of the soil profile that cheatgrass is. Um, so I think to the extent that kind of functional diversity in um, traits and the species that are selected to um, provide some breadth in the both the environments that they'll establish successfully in, but then also the 
um, I guess, ecosystem services that they'll provide. Um, I think that is super important. Um, to the second question, uh, as far as planting sagebrush and protected microsites, this is an interesting question. Bob actually might be better at answering this question because he has uh, done some research on sagebrush seeding out planting. Um, I can say that observationally, uh, sagebrush that grow, um, we've done some work aging sagebrush in natural environments and sagebrush that grow, uh, that end up growing under the canopy of another sagebrush um, are quite suppressed growth wise. So you could have two sagebrush plants of the exact same age um, where one got a bit of a height advantage at some point um, and that kind of height differential or size differential just compounds through time so that the one that's under the canopy is suppressed. Um, I don't know directly about the effects of shade. So I don't know, Bob, do you want to tag in at all? Yeah, I, we haven't really looked explicitly at, um, at shade. I think with sagebrush, there's a lot of sort of interacting and competing factors because often like you know it could you could you could plant or put a sagebrush seed in like really thick cheatgrass thatch that might actually have much more moisture and be a favorable microsite in many ways but they don't really do better in those environments because they often actually really prefer like relatively open areas open soil um, that are yeah just less competitive environments i think in many instances and provide lots of light and so i don't think there's necessarily a lot of evidence that that microsite selection is as important for something like big sagebrush as it is for um, uh, pinion pine or something like that. Great, thank you. That was the last question, but I just, I was thinking with all this great information we've heard over the last couple of days, um, I just wanna to try to like wrap my head around everything. And, and it sounds like there is no reason to freak out yet about with climate change and pinion and juniper species. And that really the take home message is that um, we really just need to look at individual sites and, um, and pay attention to, to what's going on um, in individual regions. Um, so that, so managers are just gonna have to, uh, I guess, have more information about about their um, individual site characteristics and what might be happening. And there's no like blanket statement we can make about what's happening to all pinion juniper. Is that correct? I would say that that's generally correct. Um, you know, I, I think we are seeing warning signs of some pretty of some widespread um, threats that. Uh, kind of necessitate the development of some of these management practices because right now the management toolbox for pinion juniper is pretty slim. Um, they're not really ecosystems that have had a lot of active management. And um, right now, I think it's just an open question as to whether uh, management, how effective management can be in protecting or restoring these ecosystems. Um, but we are starting to see, like I said, kind of warning signals of emerging threats that, um, that and it would be helpful to start thinking into the future. Yeah, just to reemphasize kind of what both of you said, I think, you know, there, there's no there's no danger that pinion pine or any of these juniper species are going to go extinct um, anytime in the near future. But I think, you know, if you're if you your focus is on a particular site and that site has cultural importance and that site has societal value, then there might be concern about what the long term future or even near term future of that site looks like because just because you know the species isn't going to go anywhere as a whole and doesn't mean it's not going to shift pretty drastically in where it's distributed and that can have some really important impacts depending on where you are and what your goals are. Great, thank you so much. All right, well um, thank you all for the wonderful questions and thank you so much Ali and Bob for presenting. That was uh, yeah, great information. And um, the video of this webinar will be posted on our Great Basin Fire Science Exchange YouTube channel uh, within the next few days, maybe even tomorrow. And, um, and that link will get sent to you through the um, Zoom automatic follow-up emails. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's it. All right. <laughs> thank you, every Thank you, everyone. And thank you again, Allie and Bob, for your presentations. Thank you. Have a good day.